OTB's women's football podcast, the Koi Gig Pod. You've probably caught it over the last season, where Karen Duggan joins Kathleen McNamee. Well, their team has grown by one ahead of the start of the new WSL season. Delighted to say the newest member of the Koi Gig Pod is Republic of Ireland legend Emma Byrne, who's with us now. Emma, welcome aboard the Koi Gig Pod and welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Delighted to be here and delighted to be the newest member of the team. Really looking forward to it. It's the perfect way to start next week because the Women's Super League games were pushed back by one week following the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. So why not get an 11-time champion of the English top flight onto the team? How much are you looking forward to, particularly, I guess, crossing swords with Karen Duggan, uh, your good mate over the next while, and arguing about the WSL and the Republic of Ireland national team and everything else that's going to come up with Kathleen on the Koi Geek Pod? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be great. And, you know, with the success of the Euros over the summer, everybody's interested in women's football now. And uh, we are the team to bring it to you. So, yeah, it's going to be great chatting about what's gone on the weekend, all the, the highs, the lows, and, of course, particular attention to our Irish contingency over there. And genuinely, I think we're at a point where the WSL has become the elite league because of the players that are there uh, currently. And on the back of so many of those English players having won the Euros during the summer as well, like there's a remarkable excitement about this season on the back of everything that's gone through the last couple of months or so. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it can, you can kind of feel it, can't you? The, it's just building the momentum and... You know, I've said it for a long time that the WSL is probably the best league around. I mean, we want to keep those players, though. There's been a couple of transfers in the last couple of weeks that uh, kind of takes away some of the talent from it. But you know what? What's good about it is that we can still see all those players playing around the world because women's football is growing. And of course, the platform is growing for the, for us to be able to watch them on TV. So I'm going to keep an eye on those likes of um, Kira from Man City to Barcelona and, well... You know, just heard now that Jackie Gronin's gone gone over to France. So we've lost another one of those top players. But you know what? We've signed plenty, plenty to talk about on, on the podcast. Well, in many ways, we had transfer going both ways. You've gone from Barcelona and moved to Manchester. Now we've had a record transfer from Manchester going to Barcelona as well. So maybe uh, everything balances out here. Yeah, maybe she left because she heard I was coming. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to find out. I'm going to get the answers. It's a massive opportunity, though, for Kira going there um, as the world's most expensive player now, but also joining you know, a Barcelona team who've achieved a remarkable amount. You've been watching them um, close on over the last few seasons. Their uh, Femini side have just been fantastic. Got to a couple of Champions League finals along the way. Um, the Spanish League has been going from strength to strength, even just based on the attendances that we've seen at some of the games and Barcelona breaking records in both the Champions League and in the Clásico last season. It's probably a very exciting time to join Barcelona. Yeah, it is. I mean, just for the city alone, I mean, it's just a fantastic city, isn't it? But the club itself, I mean, it's a huge, huge club. It's the biggest club in the world, let's be honest. Uh, and the women's team has definitely become that or, or has come that become that over the last couple of years. And that's from the support of the men's team as well. You know, they, they've given them that um, that platform to build and to grow. Uh, they've given them the, the support. And, and also, um, you know, media has improved over there. Still a long way to go, I have to say. It's not as good as the WSL yet. Um, but the club itself uh, have done a fantastic job in, in, you know, making it visual and, you know, allowing the games in Camp Nou, which was fantastic and absolutely brilliant. More, they, they have a record of, of, you know, for women's fans and the crowds and stuff like that. But the men's as well, they're, they're wearing fans going to watch the men's team. They're all going to watch the women's, which I thought was very nice. Yeah, I thought it was very important. I remember ahead of the Wolfsburg game, Xavi was talking about how excited he was to go to Camp Nou himself to watch the game and Carlos Puyol was talking about you're trying to get people out to watch these games and to uh, pick up the tickets to go along. It's amazing how club legends like that can have a huge influence in actually mobilising people to go to games. Yeah, I mean, it's all about, you know, who's listening and who's watching. And obviously, when you've got, got someone like Xavi speaking, he's got a, a huge, huge fan base and there are plenty of people watching. So that's that's a massive advertisement for them. And, you know, just giving that little bit of respect to, to the, the women's team and, and the women's football in general, obviously, it's going to encourage people to go. But I don't know if you watched any of the games, but I was there and, and the fans were absolutely loving it, watching good football. They stayed for an hour after the game, which which I thought was incredible. And um, they weren't there just for the football. They were there for the atmosphere. And, you know, they really shown their support. 
And um, it was a bit of a, a pain in, in the neck, really, because it took me about 45 minutes to get out of the stadium. So that was annoying me. Um, but um, yeah, no, it's just, it's just a fantastic thing. And, you know, the stadium itself is fantastic over there. And it's just down to uh, the WSL now to try and push for, for bigger stadiums and, and better stadiums. And that's the next step. Yeah, the next level. definitely. Like, it felt like a stark contrast because Barcelona were almost completely outpopulated by Eintracht Frankfurt in their Europa League knockout game. And then the women's team were playing either side of that and were actually filling the ground, which um, maybe told its own story about the men's team at Barcelona last year too. When it comes to the Women's Super League, what an exciting finish to the season last year. Went right down to the wire and Arsenal were involved in Europe and then uh, Chelsea were able to secure the title on the final day. Um, it seems it's probably well set up for a good title race again this season. Absolutely. And, you know, it gets better and better every year. So... I'm not I'm not expecting anything less this season, especially with the signings. You know, Chelsea, it's interesting, really. The the signings for Chelsea, Arsenal seem for me on paper, seem to have made the better signings. Um also you've got Man City who, who just about made the Champions League last season and uh, made a, a massive load of signings there. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a really, really good league, getting better again, as I say, every year. Uh, really excited. I was like, so excited last uh, week for it to start. Of course, um, this is the first week of it this you know, this week, so we're trying to play catch-up already. Um, and then, of course, with all the international games, it's going to be a little bit broken. But, um, yeah, just, just buzzing for it to start. Can't wait. Tomorrow's the first game. And I think I'm going to pop along to, to watch when I look at the fixtures for this weekend I can't help but look at it with a certain Irish prism with some of the Irish players who've gone over and even like Liverpool coming back up into the top flight again and with their large Irish contingent and like we're excited to see how Leanne Kieran is going to get on at top flight football after banging so many in the second flight over the last couple of seasons and you would see Neil Fahey back up there again like it's exciting to see the amount of players that have transferred over I mean we can argue the toss over whether that's a disadvantage to the Women's National League here that some of these players have left but you're going to have a lot of Vera Powell's squad getting exposed to really good football ahead of that playoff now over the next few weeks. Yeah, and, you know, f for me, that's what it's all about. If you want the Irish players to improve, they have to be playing, training day in, day out with top-class players. And unfortunately, the only way for them to do that is is to move across uh, to England. So I think it's a fantastic thing. It's it's a great thing. You can already see them reaping the rewards with the likes of Denise O'Sullivan having gone to America. She's improved unbelievably. Um, Katie as well, obviously. Uh, Neve, Louise Quinn. You know, they, they have to do it, unfortunately. And, and I'm excited to see how Jess Zoo gets on as well. I'll be watching West Ham fairly closely this season. Um, you've also got Tyler Toland, who we can't forget about in Spain. and Not part of the Irish setup at the moment. But again, it's a great thing to see. Just that, you know, they need to get that experience abroad. And it gives us great scope to talk about, doesn't it? To, to follow these players in the WSL. Yeah, like Jesu is one of those I think we'll be keeping a very keen eye on. Like was going great here at Shelburne and then the opportunity came to go across. And when I see her playing for the Republic of Ireland, there's such kind of raw talent there. There's pace, there is a kind of a rawness about the way that she approaches her attack. Slowly but surely as she refines her game, she could be a really, really important weapon in the Irish attack going forward. She is going to be. She's going to be very important. Um, and, you know, it is about playing and, and game time. And obviously she won't have been, uh, she won't have been told that she's going to play every game. That's not how it works. She has to work and she has to prove that she's ready and able. I, I don't think her her performance uh, with Aaron in the last game will do her any harm at all. I thought she played really, really well. So, um, you know, and she has to prove it in training. And I think she's the type of player that will enjoy that challenge. And uh, I think she's going to be a regular starter for West Ham. Maybe not in before Christmas, but certainly after it. Yeah. Do you feel it's a case of that is an important step now for her development? Because you know, she had become a really, really important player within the Women's National League. But I think Vera has been very clear that she wants players playing professional football and playing at the highest level they possibly can. Yeah, and obviously Vera has to be supportive of the Irish League and as we all are, I really hope that improves. I mean, uh, you know, it doesn't look great that teams are dropping out. That's uh, that's not a good start. 
But uh, as I said, you know, speaking from experience, we had to go abroad to get to improve and to play football. And and yes, uh, you can be a, a big fish in a little pond in Ireland. But at the end of the day, as soon as you move across to the, the Super League or England, America, France, Spain, all of these leagues, you're going to see that you have to work as a completely different mentality, different standard level. And uh, obviously that's going to bring you up to that level. And the, the little starlings will shine and, and get even better. And um, I mean, you can be the best in, in the league in Ireland, but at the end of the day, if you're if you're good enough, you'll play in the WSL. And that's just how it is. I know we're probably talking at the moment to some listeners and viewers who possibly watch the European Championships during the summer, might now be interested in dipping their toe and watching a bit of WSL. Who should they be watching out for in the season to come? Because I guess it's never been more accessible when you consider the amount of games that Sky are going to be showing over the coming year as well. Yeah, there are so many players. Obviously, you have to watch out for the Irish players. I mean, maybe that those would be the ones that we we want to watch. But um, I mean, every time, ta- every every team has got somebody that will be of interest. You know, Arsenal have, have made some great signings. You've got Lena Hurtig, a new signing. Uh, she's going to be interesting. Obviously, you've got Katie there. Um, you've got uh, Viv Midema, who's world class. You saw her play for the Netherlands. She's a fantastic player. Um everybody, you know, everyone loves watching Chelsea because they're such a, a you know, a counter-attacking style team. So it's exciting to watch. They're always going to score goals. And of course, when you've got Sam Kerr in your team, she's going to do, always going to do something spectacular in a game. Um, and then, of course, you've got the likes of City, who were one of the best teams for the last five, six years, dropping down now have made four or five signed in Spanish players who've come want to play football. Be interesting to see how they progress um, in this very physical league. That not so much in La Liga. Uh, I know they're really enjoying it at the moment. Um, being in Manchester, I get to speak to a lot of those players, and they're excited about it. They're excited about the physicality, and um, they're excited about how they're going to play this season. And um, so, yeah, there's lots and lots of things to talk about, to to discuss, and we'll be doing that at every podcast. Yeah, that's looking forward to the next one coming out next uh, Tuesday where uh, now Emma's going to be a regular member of the uh, group, as we'll put it, the co-host alongside uh, Karen Duggan and also with Kathleen McNamee. We haven't had a chance to speak to you since the Republic of Ireland learned their playoff opponents. Now, I don't know whether in Austria they're going to stick this up on the dressing room wall, the fact that Scotland are advertising the fact that they're looking forward to a playoff against the Republic of Ireland. Um, that might be a bit of motivation for Austria. Um, but look, it's a very, very interesting playoff series and it's so complex how this actually works out but in many ways the Republic of Ireland have to wait and see what happens with these uh, games that are coming up see what happens with Austria and Scotland and then go and win it's pretty much as simple as that uh, to keep it within their own hands about what will happen here yeah, I mean it is it is really complicated I'm still a little bit um, in the dark about how it is because even if Ireland uh, beat Scotland or Austria they're still hoping that that Iceland are, are going to drop points because otherwise they have to go in through uh, another like tournament phase and it's yeah, really really difficult um, for me I mean it couldn't have got any worse to be honest because we're playing against uh, Austria and Scotland are both the three of us are very very similar standard very similar if you look at the history there's been one nil two ones and you know winning and losing um, and we want Iceland to drop points and that we've the toughest draw. So we wanted them to play against Iceland to try and get points off them. I think Scotland definitely would have done us a favour. Um, I was talking to a couple of the, the Scotland players and yes, they are confident. They're already talking about, they're inviting me over to Scotland already. <laughs> and I keep telling them, I'm not going to Scotland, you know, to watch Austria. If Austria win, obviously I'm going to go to Austria. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so yeah, they are confident, uh, already planning their their um, celebration parties, to be honest. But uh, also speaking to a couple of the Irish girls and they're very confident because I was a little bit, of a Debbie Downer, I was like, oh, it's such bad luck. To... And they were like, no, it doesn't matter. We can beat both of them. So they're confident as well, which is great to see. Um, counting the days, to be honest. I mean, we're talking about the WSL, yeah, and that's a very exciting time but for me, the f- huge focus in October for the for the Irish national team. I think maybe uh, things have changed a little bit mentally based on this campaign too, because 
it's understandable that there was a little bit of a kind of a psychological hangover from what happened in Ukraine because that was one of those days where everything goes wrong, like a freak own goal, hitting the woodwork from a penalty, losing to a team who they know they should have beaten and it would have put them very much on course to qualify for the European Championships. They had to kind of shake that off. And to me, it almost feels like since the Australia friendly where things clicked quite well within that game, Ireland are confident, even if, if the performance isn't perfect. And I mean, look at the way the Slovakia game went for large stages and it was nervy enough against Finland. It seems this team are now able to eke out results in those kind of tight situations. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I couldn't agree with you more. The Australia game seemed to be that turning point. Um, also against Sweden, like to, to come away from a game playing a team like Sweden, to be disappointed that you didn't win and then disappointed you didn't draw with them like is I think is a massive change in the Irish mentality and you know it, it shows that we can compete against the best and we can compete up there and beat in Australia who are consistently in um the final all the fi- the World Cup finals um I think is a massive boost for them as well but I think Vera has helped that that mentality the winning mentality bringing confidence um to the Slovakia game, I mean, we weren't impressed as spectators. The girls weren't impressed with themselves, I know that, but they, they just needed to get through it and, you know, they had to win and, and win dirty and they did. It's great to see that they can get results when they don't play well um, and the fact that they know they, they haven't played well and they can do better. Um, so you're just waiting for that just to turn and, you know, I've said it when I was commentating on the game, they won't beat teams like Scotland and Austria playing like that. They know that if when they do get to the the World Cup finals, they know they're going to have to play much better than that, much better possession-based football. They, they really need to, to sort that out. And then just, you know, you know, you talk about possession, which is on another level, but you talk about the way you press, uh, the way you defend, and that needs to improve a little bit as well. But we're just going to put it down to the fact of just getting the three points and getting through it and not bothered about how, how you play. And um, that's going to, you know, it has to be a different mentality going into the, the playoffs and then in New Zealand and Australia. Can you see things evolving slowly but surely, maybe being able to play in the front foot a little bit more? Because I think now at this stage, after probably a lot of trial and error with players and positions and trying to work out who is going to be the focal point, and now it seems that, you know, it looks like that's been sorted. And now personnel-wise, with the exception of maybe working out exactly where Katie McCabe is going to play, and many of us want her to play further forward than playing at left wing back. And you know, Vera sometimes has gone with the, you know, effectively five at the back with the two wing backs, and people have criticised it for being a little bit too defensive. Is it slowly evolving, though, towards when Ireland might be able to control the game a bit more rather than having to play on the counter attack? Yeah, I, do. I, I think so. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that Vera Pau wants to play Katie McCabe higher up. Like, the fact is that sometimes, unfortunately, she has to play a bit deeper because of the, the personnel available. I think Megan Campbell coming back into the squad is a massive advantage for us. And it does mean that Katie can play higher, which, you know, is a double advantage, so to speak. Um, if we can keep Megan fit, that would be a, a massive goal for us. Um, but, you know, it, it's difficult. It's difficult when you're playing against high level and trying to keep possession every single player has to be comfortable on the ball you have to have options on the ball we've spoken about midfield getting on the ball they're all ballers you've got denise o'sullivan kate mccabe you've got rusha little john in there who all love the ball to feet but if they don't have the options to to bounce it back or to you know play one twos it's very difficult for them to keep the ball so everyone has to be comfortable and look, be looking to get on the ball and um i think there might be a couple of positions there that they need to work on in that regard. Um, But in general, I think the key is keeping Megan Campbell fit. Unfortunately, she is prone to an injury. Um, And then we can push Katie a little bit higher up and let her wander infield or wherever, wherever she wants to go. Who cares? Just, just to get her on the ball. Um, And I think Heather Payne's been absolutely fantastic up there. And I think she's learned, she's grown a lot in that position. She's, she's learned how to keep the ball playing up there high on her own. But as I said, again, for me, you have to get that uh, press correct because last game I was really, uh, I wasn't very impressed with the press, which is something that we've done quite well in the past. Yeah, there's no point in having Heather Payne trying to run alone for herself and to try and press down if the midfielder a few yards too far back. 
And like yeah. everyone yeah. has to be able to push up together if this is going to be effective. Exactly. And we're not talking about fitness anymore, which is what we used to talk about the Irish team, fitness and being physical. If you start talking about that, you have a long way to go. So it's not about fitness and pace. It's about the team being confident to push up. And when you're back three, it's supposed to be a three, by the way. So even that, the fact that we're confusing it with a three and a five, obviously there's no clarity there and you know the back the two fullbacks need to push higher up and they need to know their jobs are they playing in a three or are they playing in a five because it does make a difference to to how you set up um and and they play so deep they play so deep and actually um Brosnan is actually quite good at coming out and, and you know sweeping up behind so that they can afford to play a little bit higher because if they don't play higher it's impossible for the midfield to give Heather Payne that support in the press and in possession which is where we break down so it all starts from the keeper it all starts her pushing her back line up starts with the confidence of the back line being a little bit higher um, and for them to to deal with that ball in behind you're not going to be able to play in in a final playing so deep and worried about that ball behind. Um, again, that's something that you need to work on in training and, and be very, very clear where you want that line and where you're comfortable with and then allowing the midfield to push up and give that support to Heather because we've seen it. She does a great job doing it on her own, but it, it's old school. It's old school. We need uh, to be a, a unit together, working together and no gaps. If I can tap into your experience as uh, over 100 cap goalkeeper with the Republic of Ireland, it seems to me that Courtney Brosnan has come on a lot in the campaign just gone by. Like, there were so many question marks about who was going to be in goal for this campaign, and you know, Vera had been moving and changing around her goalkeepers in friendlies beforehand. But to me, Brosnan has looked really solid during this campaign. She has. She really has. And, you know, I'll be the first one to, to hold my hand up. I was one of those people because I don't agree that a goalkeeper should be playing international football if they're not playing regularly. Um, for a club side and that's what was, has been happening with, with Courtney Brosnan at Everton um, uh, that's probably going to change this season hopefully again we'll be keeping our eye on that um, but she has done really well she, she's dealt with everything extremely well it's fair to say that none of the goals conceded have been her fault, which is a, is something that you know we, we weren't talking about last, last year um, so she's done well and what you know, balls in the air, maybe not as as you know as confident. But again, this is game. This is game related stuff. This is where you get confidence from when you're playing week in, week out, dealing with crosses, dealing with with um, you know corners, balls into the area. But what she has done extremely well, and probably we haven't spoken about it uh, uh, enough, is that she comes out, she sweeps at the back. She's very quick to read that ball that that ball in behind or the through balls and she's done that excellently um realistically and you know that's something that we we need to talk about a little bit more because that that back line relies on that yeah and good experience now with the center backs in front of her it's becoming a very kind of settled core group which has to help i mean those relationships are so important if they're going to qualify now and are going to be hard to break down whether it's in scotland or whether it's in austria absolutely and you know i'm and not I'm not a big believer of change in range or backline or your goalkeeper anywhere else. Yes, <laughs> um, but not the backline and the goalkeeper. They need to play together. They need to know each other very, very well. It was a shame that Nifahi got injured and it would be interesting to see what Vera does now. The fact that she's back fit. Um, you know, will she put her back in there and push Megan Connolly a little bit higher up, which I think should be just a very natural thing to do. Um, but yeah, either way, they they are all they've all played together now for quite a while. Um, and they're all very used to each other. Um, very few mistakes have been made, which which is exactly what you're you're aiming for. Um, so yeah, it's just it's it's good to see they're they're in a good place. Hopefully, they can all stay fit. Um, hopefully, they'll all be available for selection for Vera and she won't have any headaches about that. Yeah, that's the thing to watch over the next few weeks. A final note just on the Republic of Ireland team. The importance of qualifying here and emotionally what it's going to mean. Some of these players have been involved in campaigns where they've come close before, where they've missed out on playoffs and missed out on going to, you know, getting to a maiden first ever finals. 
I think back to an image after the Finland game at Tallis Stadium, which was Denise O'Sullivan and Katie McCabe effectively crying on each other's shoulders at the end of the game of just sheer relief and joy to know that they were that one step closer to going to a major finals. With how well this campaign has gone and having gone and got good results in Sweden and in Finland and done really well to finish second in this group, it really is so important they actually kick on and get to the World Cup now. I mean, it is. Otherwise, you know, we're going to talk about the nearly again. I refuse to talk about how they nearly made it anymore. I'm so sick of it. Um, but, you know, I was talking to a couple of the girls on the team as well after that, and I was saying, I still don't understand what's happening. We haven't qualified. We've still a very long road ahead of us. And they were agreeing with me. They were like, yes, it's fantastic. We came second in the group. Um, any other normal tournament, we would have been talking about, you know, either going to straight into a, the, a one-off playoff or going to the finals. Um, but it's still a very long road ahead of us if things don't go our way in the play even winning the playoff and things don't go our way against um the two other teams so for me yes we can celebrate the fact that we've gone a little bit further than we've ever done before which is great it's progression but unless we actually qualify i'm not going to be going out having cocktails and celebrating you know the fact that we've gone to a playoff and haven't gone any further it's still going to be a disappointment for me because at this stage i said it before we it's time we should be qualifying at this stage keep those cocktails on ice for either vienna or for glasgow <laughs> next month uh, the koi gig pod on otb is in association with Cabri fc official snack partner to the republic of ireland women's national team emma i'm looking forward to uh, getting your insights on the koi gig pod from next week and uh, welcome aboard to the team Thanks very much.